That's what all our fights come down to is the convenience of drivers versus the physical safety of people outside cars. And we know that allocating two lanes to, to cars is going to increase our chances of having car crashes. So, I don't know. The facts are in our favour, but the culture war is difficult to fight. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. My name is John Simmerman and that is Lucy Maloney from Vancouver, British Columbia. We are going to be talking about some of the activities that she is involved with there in that area. Uh, related to Vision Zero, Safer Streets, and uh, you know, creating more places for people to ride their bikes in the city uh, and in Stanley Park. It is a good one. And let's get right to it with Lucy. Lucy Maloney, it is so wonderful to have you on the Active Towns podcast. Welcome. Thank you for having me. So Lucy, I want you to just take a moment to uh, tell everybody who you are. Who is Lucy? Well, I am an Australian person who uh, has been travelling around the world with my family for the last 15 or 20 years. I originally grew up in Melbourne, Australia, and I went to university and became a lawyer. And one of my lawyer jobs was in-house at the Environment Protection Authority in Melbourne, in Victoria, Australia. And I then started moving around. I moved to Western Australia, Singapore, Santiago, Chile. And for the last six years, I've been living here in Vancouver, Canada. Fantastic. Fantastic. Now, you and I have never met each other, but we follow each other out on Twitter. <laughs> so, uh, or X or whatever we want to call it these days. Uh, and, and, and you, you go by the tagline. Lucy in Canada. And I think that's a reflection of my international viewpoint and the fact that when I was using Twitter in other places, I'd never really know where people were from. And sometimes it's kind of really helpful to understand um, their perspective, particularly people from the United States, since um, as an Australian, I guess the way our government is run and the way our legal system is run and some of the things that affect our lives are different. So to understand people's tweets, it, it, it kind of was helpful to look in people's bios to see, oh, well, oh, right, you're from Massachusetts. I get it. No wonder you're worried about, for example, mass shootings, medical care, whatever it might be. Yeah, yeah, yeah fantastic. And yeah, it, it, you, you see your bio right there on Aussie uh, and you, you have uh, uh, very much a passion for for streets and street safety and uh, active transport. Where did all that come from? Did you come to Vancouver with that already ingrained? Do you know, it's been developing across my life. Sometimes I, I think about this. I've always been a cycle commuter. I have I rode my bike to and from elementary school or primary school as we, we know it in Australia, secondary school, university, work. I've been a vehicular site, uh, cyclist, you know, and I, um, I've also tried to navigate without a car around cities with a baby and a toddler and a pram, you know, that was in Singapore particularly. And just I've always really noticed, you know, apart from the obvious, which is um, when I was riding home from university um, one day, I was hit from behind in a murder strip bike bike lane when someone was trying to merge on a left, uh, well, this is confusing for Americans because we're talking about the other side of the street. The other but, side, yeah. <laughs> um, someone was trying to exit the busy road that I was cycling on and they were having an argument with their husband and thankfully they were driving a very small car and they hit me from behind and I was barely barely injured. My law textbooks hit me in the butt and gave me a bruise, but I landed like a jumbo jet and was super lucky. But I've been doored. My grandfather was run over by a car crossing the road. I've had friends killed in car crashes. I have did triathlons for a while and we lost some triathletes training on the roads. You know, and I've noticed desire lines worn through 
lawns that haven't had properly designed paths. It's all just sort of culmination of my life experiences and my interests. I suppose I'm more of a progressive leaning person politically and I've got all the experiences of being a um, non-paid stay-at-home mother and a woman in society and a childless professional riding my bike along the busy highways to get to and from work as quickly as possible. You know, I don't I don't know exactly what it is, but through the course of my life, I've really become very um, passionate about the rights of people to get around without, um, to have the choice not to own and drive a car. You know, it's, I guess it's a social justice issue, particularly because so many people are too old, too young, too poor or disabled in a way that stops them from um, owning and using a car. And also it's just so much more fun getting around by bike. Right. Yeah. And, you know, this this video that you passed along uh, for us is is the scene of, uh, well, describe it. What is this scene? What's going on here? This looks like fun. Well, this is really fun. So great. So I'm the chair of the PAC or Parent Advisory Council of Lord Roberts Elementary School in the West End of Vancouver, which is a really dense inner urban area. There's the school. This is Comox Street or Comox Greenway. It's part of the official Vancouver um, cycling network and it's rated AAA for all ages and abilities. But before... um, this school street, and this is what you're looking at, you're looking at a school street, was put in place and run by volunteers for over two years. Uh, This would have been filled with cars, honking their horns at each other, trying to get around each other, absolutely impossible. At the time, it needed to be the safest for people using active transport to commute. It was the most dangerous So we had two blissful years where we ran a school street with volunteers, but it was just unsustainable. So at the end of the last school year, so at the end of June this year, we told the city we were going to stop running it with volunteers and we um, were hoping that we would have a permanent school street in place. We lobbied really hard. I had a million meetings with uh, elected officials, wrote op- opinion pieces in the newspapers and lobbied and lobbied residents and we wrote millions of emails and unfortunately what it would have taken is staff to have feel like they had the backing of the councillors in reallocating this street space. So it didn't need to go to a council vote. But as I told many of the councillors that I met with, it would have required them intervening to tell staff that they wouldn't overturn it and that they should go ahead with it for it to go ahead. And that is not what happened. So we uh, we don't have a school street anymore. And it's kind of fine at the moment on non-rainy days, but as soon as it rains, lots more people drive their cars and it goes right back to the way it was. So it's impossibly unsafe for anybody outside a car to set foot on that street because it's chopped with driving parents. Right. Yeah. For those who may be a little bit unfamiliar with the concept of a school street, uh, I think we can kind of figure it out from that little video that we had going. But go ahead and describe it, you know, sort of like officially uh, from the, the, the standpoint of, of the implementation there in Vancouver. Well, it's part of the city of Vancouver's hugely popular school street program where one block of one street adjacent to an elementary school is closed to cars and open to people at pick-up and drop-off times, and it's run by volunteers. So the City of Vancouver is trying to expand its school street program so that we're not so reliant on volunteers. And some of the ideas that are being thrown around are uh, what they're doing in London at the moment, which that is they have signs saying this is a school street at these times. And if they don't have physical barriers in place, they have cameras that give you a fine. And so that temporary school street program, we 
up saw whore barriers at either end of the block and they're put in place by volunteers. The street is supervised by volunteers and they're taken away at the end of the time. And it creates space for kids to ride bikes and scooters and skateboards and do rollerblading and chalk drawings on the street and for passing cyclists to have a safe route that's not gummed up with the driving parents Our school, you couldn't have asked for a a more suitable school to put in place a permanent school street because there are no driveways on that street. It's already a AAA rated bike route. And also it's a really dense inner urban area where the majority of families are already using active transport to get to and from school. So really catering to driving parents at our school is catering to to the minority at the expense of everybody outside a car, which is the majority of people. You know, we've got a small catchment for our school. Most families uh, live within walking distance. Yeah. yeah. And, and you've referenced AAA rated a couple of times. And, and I remember the last time I was in Vancouver filming on Comox. Yes, it's an all ages and abilities. That's what the the, the AAA uh, refers to, a little short shorthand uh, for all ages and abilities uh, facility. And it's, it's one of those streets that is, you don't see a ton of infrastructure, cycling infrastructure. What it really is, is it's a traffic calmed environment, low volumes of cars and- you know, Allegedly. Allegedly, yes, um, and and low speed. And as I remember from Comox, I remember seeing and filming quite a few uh, modal filter areas where where cars are diverted off. And so, just the whole point that that there's even this issue of cars, you know, of drivers, of parents feeling compelled to have to bring a car to the school in that type of environment is just a real head scratcher. Yeah, it's a real combination of factors. I, I We've got lots of modal filters in the West End and they work really well to make it a beautifully serene and peaceful, quiet um, residential neighbourhood, even though it's right downtown. And um, you'd expect it to be noisier because it's a very dense area where tens of thousands of people live in close quarters. But, you know... The fact is that it's um, motor vehicles that make cities noisy, not density. So really, I felt like for sure we were doing people a favour by um, by making their street quieter with less traffic at pick-up and drop-off times and less um, drivers honking their horns at each other. But, uh, you know, the desire to have vehicle access on that street is very strong and people are scared of change and... Uh, so I, I think it's a real change. I'm lucky enough to live on a car-free street myself and, uh, you know, I want that for everybody. It's it's a good thing. It's it's lovely. It's a thing that, you know, we were prepared to pay a premium for and so it's a bit hard for me to understand. But as I said, change can be difficult for some people. Yeah. So you live on a car-free street, not a car light street, but a car-free street. Wow. Well, one, one, we live in a townhouse in a very large strata and uh, we can access the back of our townhouse through a parkade, but the front of our townhouse is on a car-free street. It's incredible. Yeah. Uh, it's so joyful watching, especially in summer with so many cyclists going past and people running and, um, you know, dogs. It's absolutely beautiful. <laughs> Now, we're, we're going we're gonna to spend some time talking about Stanley Park a fair amount and, and all of that, but uh, let's, let's go back to Melbourne. And, and did you notice these types of challenges? Like, uh, I know that in, uh, I haven't visited yet. I need to get there. So I, I'm, I have so many of my interviews from down under, they're encouraging me to get there and, 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 and check out what's going on. As I understand, um, alleys are a big thing there. Is that correct in in Melbourne? Yeah. Well, look, you have to understand that I haven't lived in Melbourne um, for quite a while and I haven't even visited Melbourne since before the pandemic. Um, But I do follow Melbourne cycling advocates very closely on Twitter and I'm always applauding them from afar when they 
had any wins at all and uh, commiserating with them when people are killed and um, and when they lose fights to get separated cycling infrastructure. So, uh, yeah, I'm really cheering them on and I, I hope to, you know, go back and visit and see all their good work at some stage soon. So, But uh, when I was cycling uh, a lot for transport in Melbourne, uh, it was really, as I said, I was a vehicular cyclist. Well, you had to be if you're going. Yeah, if you're going to get painted bike lanes, if anything at all. And as all remember, I used to ride in um, to the city each day along the Nepean Highway, and there was a separated bike lane that I turned my nose up at because I think it had been designed by a landscape architect. I apologise to all landscape architects, but you haven't got a great track record in designing cycling infrastructure. I'm sorry, people. Um, And it just had all these lovely curves it was not for people to get anywhere fast it was a recreational and um so i just was on the road with the cars and was a stupid 20 something um who didn't have uh much uh idea of my own mortality until i was like hit and anyway yeah yeah exactly exactly so you and i were really connected mainly because of a, um, a, a thing that sort of boiled up on on Twitter uh, in November. It was it November or was it October? It was October, I think. And um, and it was really y- you were representing uh, Vision Zero uh, Vancouver. So talk a little bit about Vision Zero Vancouver and the role that you have been playing. Well, I'm loosely affiliated with a whole bunch of like-minded groups in in Vancouver and partially it's because I don't like um, replying to emails or doing paperwork, so I just flip between them without taking any administrative responsibilities. So Vision Zero Vancouver is one of the groups that I am tangentially related to. They're all uh, they're an incredible group of young people who are deeply committed to reducing deaths and injuries on Greater Vancouver's roads. And I'm hugely admiring of their work and their success. And I'm quite often their spokesperson of last resort because they're all busy earning a living and um, studying. And so, but unfortunately, the media needs to speak to people with very short notice and often right during the middle of the day. So, I'm, we're we're on Discord and I go, oh yeah, okay, I can do it. <laughs> and you, you get you get the call. No one else so. wants to do it. I, yeah. I end up doing it because we feel like we don't want to say no to the media when they're giving us an opportunity to promote our messages and achieve our goals, which and the media is quite often very effective for that. So yeah, I end up that's what I do with them and provide a bit of I go to meetings with them sometimes and, and help where I can. So it's this video that prompted me to reach out to you uh, to talk about this because this particular thing that sort of blew up is kind of from your neck of the woods, right? Because Richmond is is up there in BC, correct? Yeah, yeah. Richmond is part of Greater Vancouver. So if you um, if you come into Vancouver International Airport, you'll be in Richmond. So it's just the it's kind of the next kind of the next city over from from Vancouver. Yeah. Well, let's press play on this and this will set up the context and it'll remind everybody of uh, sort of what happened and what boiled up uh, a couple months ago in October. Your group is dedicated to reducing and eliminating traffic deaths, as I suppose as best as, uh, as, as can be. What went through your mind when you first saw this video? Well, the first thing that I noticed was that um, the girl that's crossing the road isn't doing anything illegal. She's mm-hmm. she's pressed the button. She's on a marked crosswalk. She's paying attention. She's uh, not doing anything illegal. Mm-hmm. Whereas the driver is looking at their phone. So this girl could have been dancing across the crosswalk in a neon ball frock and this guy would not have seen her. Mm-hmm. So it's absolutely not an equivalent thing. Now, we have heard from the Richmond RCMP in a, in a statement they say, in part, the video is not about, quote, X being more right than Y. The purpose of the video is to reduce harm, save lives, create awareness, full stop, nothing more and certainly nothing less. Uh, I mean, as you mentioned, it shows somebody breaking the law and it shows somebody who's not doing that. How do you think they could have done a better job with, with perhaps subtleties when it comes to 
because the message was uh, uh, a pedestrian safety is a two-way street. I think it shouldn't have been a surprise to the Richmond RCMP that this would be badly received. Mm -hmm. Every year we get public safety campaigns that are effectively victim blame. They put responsibility on vulnerable road users outside cars mm -hmm. to be responsible for their own safety. And that's, that's not really getting to the core of what causes traffic deaths and injuries on our roads. You know, we've got um, other things like the design of cars, the design of the infrastructure, that was a super wide road, uh, and driver behaviour, which is disproportionately responsible for terrible consequences. You know, the consequence for the driver would have been, oops, bang, mm -hmm. um, the, the consequence for the pedestrian would have been uh, serious injury or possibly even tragic consequences. If you were to design a video like this, what would you do? Well, uh, what I would do is I would have pic pictures of politicians listening to um, experts telling them about what really contributes to um, us reducing traffic deaths and injuries on our roads. And I'd have um, pictures of people telling police that enforcement is a really good idea and automated enforcement is a really good idea. Where I'm from, Australia, there's a lot more video enforcement of people using their phones, which doesn't require um, an individual police officer to pull people over mm -hmm. uh, and process them very slowly. You get uh, the first you know about it is that you get a ticket in the mail and that's in addition to on the street enforcement. And perhaps if the message hasn't landed, also perhaps a good reminder, even if it wasn't uh, presented well, that if you are going to be crossing a road of some description and not trying to victim shame, that you want to look up, you want to make sure that you can see your surroundings. Well, I don't want to give that message because um, I'm concerned about um, the needs of children and vision and hearing impaired people and people who are using wheelchairs or other mobility devices that makes, make them sit lower on the road and are more visible. And I think that everybody outside cars is already brutally aware of keeping themselves safe on the roads. What we need to do is influence um, how our infrastructure is built so um, drivers get visual cues to go more slowly on our roads and we need to work on driver behaviour through enforcement. Lucy Maloney with Vision Zero Vancouver, thank you Brilliant. for joining us. Thank you. Uh, that was just It's a, really that hard was... watching myself but it's kind of good for trying to improve next time. <laughs> well yeah and believe me I get it you know that's I'm, I'm recording these things every single day and then having to go back and record or you know, edit them and all that but I have to say that that was one, one of the reasons why I was so passionate about getting you on the, the channel for this uh, conversation is you handled that so incredibly well. And now that I know that you are an attorney, I'm not as surprised. You, it, it was it was very, very you, you you stayed on point and you didn't take the easy bait of saying, oh, yeah. And you're like, no, I, I don't want to say that. I don't want to go in that direction. And it really is so important in the layering of we need to get the infrastructure right. Once we have the infrastructure right, then we need to look at enforcement. You know, it's like these layers of it. And the yeah. very, very last thing should be, you know, safe, personal safety approach and equipment and invisible. You know, it's the it's very, very far down the list. Uh, and you pointed it out so deftly there, I, I want to say, of saying that, you know, yeah, you think about people who are vision, you know, impaired or, you know, yeah. So again, kudos. Fantastic. Well, what I want to say about that is that it's a real team effort. You know, I'm the spokesperson, but there are two main things that contribute apart from my own life experience and, you know, being confident with public speaking and all that. One of them is that my own little organisation is called Love the Lane and it's a very small operation and one of my um, co-conspirators in Love the Lane is a media professional who has done so much for me um, in giving me very blunt feedback such as you've got terrible resting bitch face, you need to smile more when you do media. <laughs> yeah. Luckily, I open to receiving feedback like that. Um, he helps me to practice. He helps to give me feedback about what I'm what I could improve on. So 
he knows who he is and he has helped me so much in improving my media messaging um, through all the practice that I've gotten through our disastrous lack of success <laughs> in recent times. But also Vision Zero Vancouver, we have we get on the chat on Discord and we workshop um, our positions on things. So what comes out of my mouth is the product of a whole bunch of input from other people. Yeah, fantastic. I, I appreciate that. I also uh, pulled up lovethelane.ca. I think that's what we're you're talking about, correct? Yeah. So this brings us this brings us over to the lane that we're having difficulties with. Is that correct? Yeah, it's we we're broadening out um, our work, but uh, Love the Lane was originally um, a response to the municipal election that happened in October last year. It seems like longer ago, but um, where a, a municipal government swept in with a super majority and immediately announced that they were going to rip out the incredibly wonderful and popular Stanley Park bike lane. Uh, I'm not sure if everyone's familiar with Stanley Park, but they call it the jewel of Vancouver. It's this incredibly large forest park with a, a about a 10 kilometre road around the outside. What you can see there in that picture is the Stanley Park seawall, which um, is one bike path, but we had an additional bike path on the road. So the seawall bike path is the ultimate tourist experience. So you ride a bike right around the outside of the park, incredible views, but it's pretty narrow and pretty slow. Um, when you uh, want to do a workout ride, like I I want to, or it's a hot day, you want some shade, or you want to access any of the attractions in the middle of Stanley Park, it's nice to have a safe bike lane on Stanley Park Drive because it's very difficult to get from the seawall bike path that's flat around the very outside at sea level into the mountainous middle of, of the park. So it was a pandemic response. So at the beginning of the pandemic, like that very first May of 2020, the City of Vancouver and the Park Board created Beach Avenue Bikeway and cl completely closed Stanley Park to visitors' cars. And, of course, we didn't have really um, strict lockdowns at all in Vancouver. There were some, some restrictions, but basically you could go out and do your exercise whenever you wanted and be physically distanced out, outdoors. And so it felt like the whole of Vancouver dusted off their bikes and just started enjoying doing laps of Stanley Park Drive through the forest and the seawall bike path was actually restricted to to people on foot only so everyone was on the road so that was the first two months and then they put in a bike path so the, yeah the first two months it was completely close to cars and then they put in an orange cone um, bike path so that cars could get in and then half the road was allocated to people on bicycles. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very fascinating. So yeah, uh, we, I've been sort of following it from afar, uh, that, you know, so I, I, I remember hearing that, yes, the, the seawall was, was pedestrian only during that period of time. And, and then this was there. So this article is really, uh, this is from last November uh, 2022. So this is what you were referring to is that, um, you know, a new government has come in and it's it's looking like this has become, as you mentioned earlier, change is difficult. It's become a controversial flashpoint and, you know, and they're, they want the cars back in. I mean, I'm, I've got the same thing just you know, walking distance from my house. We've got our crown jewel of the park, uh, of the city, Zilker Park, and there's cars that race through the middle of it. And it's just like, why? Why do we have cars racing through the middle of our crown jewel park? So, yeah. Yeah, it's super frustrating because uh, you get the traffic that you build for and, you know, there's been some frustrating discussion about needing to look at pre-pandemic levels to work out what what the traffic levels are. But of course, the pre-pandemic motor vehicle traffic levels were directly related to the fact that Stanley Park Drive was 
entirely designed for the convenience and throughput of motor vehicles and the convenient car parking of motor vehicles. You know, there's there, there's barely even a curb cut for huge distances. There are very few um, sidewalks for people once they get out of their cars to, to use to get around. Uh, so really pre-pandemic, the pre-pandemic configuration in Stanley Park only suits motor vehicles, not even their occupants, once they stop. So uh, that it became a huge culture war, which is very frustrating. And a lot of mythology and um, misinformation, of course, got spread around that, you know, you couldn't get into Stanley Park because you couldn't get in with a car, which wasn't even true once the first two months were finished. You had one lane instead of two. But we know that Sometimes the drivers of motor vehicles often <laughs> equate their own convenience with access. But what I always say about Stanley Park is that the year-round safety of cyclists has been sacrificed to the convenience of drivers at peak times. That's one of my little sound bites that comes out in almost every interview I do about Stanley Park. But it's very true, you know. And that's what all our fights come down to is the convenience of drivers versus the physical safety of people outside cars. So that's an ongoing thing. And that's why I get better and better at media. It's because it's always the same thing you're trying to say. So in different ways, in different situations. It's interesting too, because when we, we, we look at the reality of how Stanley Park is situated, uh, and, and in that one picture, you can kind of see the the massive bridge that is you know in in place, and you know kind of you know, the seawall is there. Seawall goes underneath the pathway, goes underneath the bridge. That bridge can get you over uh, to West Vancouver, um, and the but in the park itself, I mean. Where are these drivers going to or feel they have the absolute need to get to so urgently that it, you know, clearly it wasn't needed if, if, if they were able to, for two months, go completely car free. I mean, the, the earth didn't stop spinning. So, <laughs> well, the things that I often say about Stanley Park is that one lane for cars is a compromise and it's definitely not ne necessary to have two lanes for motor vehicles. And the other thing that we're, we're trying to do is possibly rebrand it as an emergency services uh, access lane that, that cyclists can use because obviously it's a real problem um, getting into some areas of Stanley Park if there is a car crash or a forest fire or there just is a lot of traffic on at peak times, whereas you might be completely unable to pass with an emergency services vehicle uh, if there are two rows of cars blocking the road. Uh, it's very easy generally for uh, cyclists to just pick their bikes up and move them over so that an ambulance or a fire truck can get through along the bike path if it's sufficiently wide. So we uh, wish, wish we wish we'd thought of that a few years ago because things might be different. Yeah, yeah. What is the update, most recent update as to, to where we're at on all this? Well, the most recent update on Stanley Park is quite dramatic, actually, because um, I'm actually one of the things that I might be doing later this afternoon if I can fit it in between meetings is call into the City of Vancouver Council meeting today where there, there's a motion to ask the, the provincial government to amend the Vancouver Charter to abolish the park board who has jurisdiction over Stanley Park so that council makes decisions. And that's going to affect us a lot because, um, and the I suspect part of the reason why they're doing that is because there's been a split. So there were six ABC councillors, and that's the supermajority party, and one Vancouver Greens councillor. Now, the um, three of the 
um, ABC councillors have been voting in a block with the Greens guy, so they've got a majority. And so there's a bit of internal disagreement. And uh, so I'm not sure that the party central is very happy that they've lost control of the park board. So I'm almost 100% certain that that's the case because they've, they've actually expelled those three ABC park board commissioners from the party. So there are only three left. So there's an there are three independents plus the Vancouver Greens commissioner. And uh, so today at Vancouver Council, councils will be voting to ask the provincial government to abolish the park board. And uh, I think that will significantly reduce uh, chances of getting a permanent lane put in place, even though that was um, an election promise of um, the ABC party at, because what they were going to do is rip the bike lane out. Then by summer 2023, which is the summer that's just passed, they would have installed a permanent bike lane. Now, any of us that know about the, how complicated it is to design and implement a, a, a bike lane like that probably realised that that was a very unrealistic goal, but they, then they were going to install a permanent lane by next summer and the park board staff just submitted a report to to them at a couple of park board meetings ago um, saying we haven't got the money and we haven't got the time and there's no way you're going to get a permanent bike lane installed on Stanley Park Drive by summer 2024. So that was the latest round of media. And so part of the problem is that ABC wants to have two general vehicle lanes plus a bike lane, which I think for most of the park is a terrible idea because what staff reported to the commissioners at that recent park board meeting was that when the bike lane was in place and motor vehicles only had one lane, there was a very small amount of um, exceeding the speed limit, which is 30 kilometres an hour, which I believe is 20 miles an hour. About 17, yeah. Yeah. And um, and as soon as they pulled out the bike lane and measured vehicle speeds this summer, uh, about 80% of drivers were exceeding the speed limit by 20 kilometres an hour, which is, uh, yeah, I can't translate that, sorry, but uh, it was not a surprise to any of us that understand that one of the key infrastructure factors contributing to speeding and therefore deaths and injuries on our roads is wide lanes and multiple lanes. Once you, a driver can't pass, they're restricted to the speed of the vehicle in front of them. So no surprises there. So we definitely don't want an overtaking lane all the way around the park for vehicles because it will be just dangerous for everybody. Yeah. Do you get the sense that part of the challenge here is that many of the powers that be the people who are in position are just viewing this as a non-essential um, route for people riding bikes, you know, oh, they're just going for exercise and getting some, you know, it's like, why are they on a bike? Why don't they just go for a walk on the seawall, you know, kind of thing? Is it just kind of a lack of respect for people on bikes I think there's some really serious antipathy towards cyclists in, in Vancouver that I noticed almost as soon as I arrived. I mean, I think it's everywhere. There's an unfortunate politicisation of an othering of cyclists and a lack of recognition that it's a very legitimate form of transport. But it's so confusing in the park because people driving in the park are, are recreationally driving. Right. You know, it's a I mean, this is this is a when you're driving on this, you're basically I mean, again, as I mentioned earlier, there's no like meaningful you're, you're not going to work by driving through here, just like the person on the bike is not riding to work through the park necessarily. I guess it's technically possible, but not likely. Mostly, you know, when you when you see this image, you realize this is a park. This is a place for restoration and, you know, uh, again, it brings me back to how flabbergasted I am that we have built these motorways through parks. And, um, you know, I get the whole parkway movement. There was an entire movement, you know, uh, after cars came along where, you know, that was a thing. You built 
roadways through green spaces and you would go for a Sunday drive and relax and you know, take it in. I get that. I get that. But that's not what Stanley Park is. I mean, this is a beautiful area for restoration. There's plenty of wild spaces there. I've even ridden um, my little Brompton bike on some of the mountain biking uh, and, and, and natural surface trails there. I mean, there's just beautiful spaces there. there cars just, you know, need to be minimized, not maximized. Yeah, you know, uh, a lot of the opponents of the bike lane on Stanley Park Drive point to places like Central Park and to differentiate Stanley Park and they say, well, look, if you if you look at Central Park, you've got entrances and exits where people can be dropped off and picked up all around the edge and that's why they can get away with um, having no having cars banned and cars not being able to drive through. But what I say is that one lane for motor vehicles is the compromise. Two lanes is not a compromise. Two lanes excludes people using active transport and cycling recreationally. And I I suppose the other main frustration for me is that allocating road space to um, cycling on Stanley Park Drive achieves so many public policy goals that are so important about climate, about um, public health and trying to in- increase active physical activity, physical and mental health, equity, you name it, the protected bike lane on Stanley Park brought us further towards those public policy goals. So there aren't many public policy goals that are achieved by um, two lanes for cars. It it, you know, even putting my Vision Zero Vancouver hat back on for a minute, if we're trying to reduce, we know that speeding is the number one cause of deaths and injuries and um, motor vehicle crashes. And we know that allocating two lanes to to cars is going to increase our chances of having car crashes. So I don't know. The facts are in our favour, but the culture war is difficult to fight. And just the irony, too, since most of those motor vehicles are going to be internal combustion engines, you know, burning fossil fuels through this nature area. I mean, yeah. Okay. Well, best of luck if you do, you know, participate later today and best of luck uh, on that continued fight. You, you just put your Vision Zero hat on briefly there for a moment. So I'm going to uh, keep, keep that Vision Zero hat on and we'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the, the, the comments that you made, um, you know, for uh, Halloween. And of course, uh, well, I'll let you set this up. We won't turn the volume on this video uh, for it, but I'll, I'll actually go ahead and press play because I know that there's some nice little B-roll that's in here. Why don't you give the, the context and, and, and talk a little bit about what your response was? Because again, you, you did a really, really good job of keeping us focused on what we should be focusing on uh, in, in this particular story as well. Yeah, I um. So this was for Halloween, and what uh, I was doing was uh, responding to a media media request for Vision Zero Vancouver to talk about how um, you know, we always get these public safety announcements saying, "Oh, dress your kids up like construction workers so that they're safe on Halloween," when it's absolutely outrageous that you you would expect business as usual from drivers on. On Halloween, the Vision Zero Vancouver message on Halloween is leave your car at home for four hours on Halloween. It's not that much to ask. Don't drive on Halloween unless you absolutely have to. And if you do have to drive, take it slowly and carefully, even more than usual, to make sure that you don't um, run over trick or treaters who are dressed in black. I mean, imagine asking. Um, people to ruin their costumes. Uh, Yeah, there I am. Don't run over our little (laughs) trick-or-treaters. It's funny. I usually get very little notice of um, when we have to, when I have to go and speak to the media. So what I do is when I'm throwing on my makeup and trying to make myself look decent, I, um, I just practice saying our key points out loud. I think of three key points. I work out, um, how I'm going to say them, I rehearse them. And, um, you know, I do try and answer the questions, especially if it's a live interview, because it's not good entertainment unless you're having a conversation. 
And let's face it, um, it is entertainment that they're trying to produce. So um, it is, yeah. yeah. So I I think about the points that I'm I'm trying to make, and I find a way um, with the questions that they ask to get my key messages through, and to avoid giving them the conflict narrative that that's over an oversimplification and a, maybe a victim blaming narrative that is all that might be left once they edit it out. So I've had interviews not even air because I haven't given them what they've been looking for, which is, a you know, I'm angry from cyclists when, in fact, it's more complicated than that. Yeah, yeah. No, in fact, that that's so important that you, you point that out is that a big part of uh, this whole culture war kind of thing is you've got to get these, you got to get these two sides that are fighting each other. And the, the fact that, that you have done such a really good job, I think delivering the, the message that's on point and not buying into, you know, sort of the, the easy things of, of victim blaming and, and all that you kind of stay the course and you do it in a very respectful way. And, and so I think it's a, a really, Hopefully folks will find this video and this episode uh, very helpful as uh, inspiration for how you're handling things from an advocacy perspective within your own communities is it, it doesn't really serve us to to get into name calling and, vic, you know, and, and basically I almost said victim blaming, but getting into the, the, the that process of shaming and blaming people, you know, back and forth, it, it doesn't really serve us, you know, to do that, we need to kind of stay focused on on what the real goal is: is change policy. I mean, that's that's that is correct, and you know, my style of advocacy is what I think that I'm good at and what I can contribute. But I'm not saying that there's no place for really flipping tables. You know, I absolutely respect uh, and admire people that just that won't even talk to the elected officials and are constantly at them on social media I mean I feel as though there's a place for for many different styles of advocacy so I'm meeting hopefully shortly with a counsellor that a, a lot of people who are cycling advocates probably think is a hopeless case, but I'm I'm going to hopefully have a conversation with this person and find out if there's anything that I consider to be a priority that they're interested in leading, you know. And I might not have any success, but it's funny. I'm super motivated to find out like why are we losing and when are we losing and what can I do? How early do I have to get in? And who do I have to speak to and reason with and persuade and influence to change our luck? You know, and it might be that we um, we don't have any success without having a, a majority government, but there are some projects that we might be able to get done. Now, not everyone um, feels that way, and I've had been criticised for, for being an ABC apologist more than once, but, you know, I, I think that I strike um, a good balance for me in being very straightforward in the media when I don't like something but you know in a in a clear and respectful way but you know clearly not happy and saying why um but also I'm able to have good one-on-one -on -one relationships and conversations with the people who are making the decisions to hopefully do what I can within their political leanings and other narratives that they're subject to yeah and I'm glad you did uh, point that out and say that um, is there there absolutely is uh, places for uh, what I like to call the activists, the people who will literally yeah. lay down in the middle of the street and say, you know, hey, we need to protest yeah. this. Absolutely. So there's there's space. For, there There's a place, uh, you know, in every city for those people who are going to be the agitators and the activists that, that are going to be doing that. But then there's the, the advocates that are doing kind of what you're emulating here, which is, you know, being a spokesperson for many of the organizations that you're uh, associated with and working with. And when the news media catch on to the fact that, Hey, Lucy's a straight shooter. She's going to, you know, she's going to give a good interview and et cetera. They may not give you the, the tidbits and that juicy stuff. You know, Lucy may not deliver that, but she's going to, you know, be, you know, 
delivering a, a you know a, a good message in a professional uh, and respectful way. So I think that that's really important. You know, and with the media, sometimes it's as, as simple as they need to create content for that that day, and if you're available, you get your stuff on, right? So it, it can be, you know, they the media have so few resources to get their their stuff out there to get their programs running, and you know, if I can, um, that's why I try and feed them content that pushes our messages and I keep them informed about when things are coming up and are slant on it and I try and help them when, wherever I can and I am available at the drop of a hat to go and meet them wherever they want and then I get my sound bites on the news. So it's great to understand how they work and how few resources they have in order to work with them to get our messages out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um I, I pulled up your your, your Twitter uh, slash X uh, uh, profile once again, and uh, I, I love the fact that Lucy is also profiled in here. You, know, you have the picture of yeah. Lucy in in your in your, your your photo there. Is there anything that we haven't talked about that you want to uh, make sure to leave the audience with here today? Well, um, I suppose I mean I'm I try and work. Um, closely with um, various organisations and talk to people to make sure that I'm supporting their goals wherever I can. So I work with the main cycling advocacy organisation, which is called Hub Cycling. And um, Jeff Lee, who's the president of Hub, I often blurb on about how much I love him and love working with him. He and I are really kindred spirits. He's an ex-engineer and my father's an ex-engineer and uh we just get along really well. So if all my advocacy, I he's an incredible mentor and role model and he's also got all the history of um, of Vancouver and its bike lanes at the, on the tip of his tongue and we often go on what I call regaling rides where we, we go out cycling somewhere and um, he'll stop and talk to me about all the battles that have been fought and, you know, what it was used for and which section of lands owned by the railway company or Metro Vancouver or the province or the city or the city of Burnaby or whatever it is. Working with other people is one of the most rewarding parts of what I do. And I feel as though I've got some very, very narrow strengths that I can use to um, move things forward and I really do benefit from, you know, the kind of collegiate uh, approach of, of working with Vision Zero Vancouver and My Little Love the Lane and Hub Cycling and there's a new transit advocacy group that's just started called Movement and they're trying to get more, um, more frequent buses and cleaner buses and more bus shelters and you know we've all got so much in common and if we band together we can resist what what usually happens which is they make us fight with each other so you can't have the bike lane because we've got to have the rapid bus lane so sorry cyclists or or um you can't have a wider footpath or sidewalk because of the bike path you know we're all it's, it, it doesn't come down to that. That distracts us from the fact that we should be reallocating street space and priority away from motor vehicles. So I'm, I'm just trying to connect people and benefit from other people's knowledge and expertise to so that we all um, are able to move our messages forward and, and make some progress. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well said. And, and, uh, and honestly, that's exactly what Motordom wants us to do: is to get distracted and start infighting and not not being you know laser focused on pushing for the political change that needs to take place, the policy changes that need to take place, uh, because as long as as they can, you know, keep doing what they're doing from a status quo, the motoring motoring Motordom, as Peter Norton likes to to, to call it, uh, just keeps chugging along. So yeah. It's good stuff. Uh, Lucy, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. This has been an absolute joy. Well, thank you. It's a, a real honor to be here. Thanks. Hey, thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Lucy Maloney. And if you did, please 
give it a thumbs up, leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on the subscription button down below and ring that notifications bell. And if you're enjoying the content that I'm producing, please consider becoming an Active Towns ambassador. It's easy to do. Just click on the link down below uh, for activetowns.org. You can click on the support button and there's several different options, including becoming a Patreon supporter. Uh, patrons do get access to all of this video content early and ad free. Again, thank you so much for tuning in. It really means so much to me. And until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me a Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.